Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Larry Loftus. Larry Loftus. Oh, I'm happy to do it. Thrilled. Good evening. My name is Melissa Giller. I have the honor of being the Chief Marketing Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you for joining us this evening. In honor of our men and women who defend our freedom around the world, if you could please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we go further, I would like to introduce uh, my boss, the brand new president and CEO of the Reagan Foundation and Institute, David Trulio. In 1953, Israel's parliament unanimously passed the Yad Vashem law, which established the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority in order to document and record the history of the Jewish people during the Holocaust, as well as to acknowledge the countless non-Jewish individuals who risked their lives to save Jews. In 1963, Yad Vashem began to, began to award the title Righteous Among the Nations which awards non-Jews who risk their lives, liberty, or positions to save Jews during the Holocaust. Since that time, over 22,000 rescuers from 44 countries have been acknowledged for their efforts. On December 12, 1967, Corrie Ten Boom was recognized with this award for her efforts in saving nearly 800 Jewish lives during World War II, as well as for her arrest and deportation into the camps which not everyone from her family survived. It is for this heroic story that we are gathered together today. So enter New York Times and international best-selling author Larry Loftus. When he's not researching and writing books, um, such as Into the Lion's Mouth and The Princess Spy, he can be found per his website at the gym or on the mats practicing jiu-jitsu um, or exercising outside. And I've seen the photos, and this is not a guy to be messed with, so let's all be careful here tonight. Just want to get that clear. As we were preparing to open our exhibition, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, it became our intention to bring to our community one to two events each month to help learn about as many survivors and victims as we can to help keep their memories alive. We encourage you to visit our website, uh, reaganfoundation.org events to find out which events are coming up. These events are not just the stories of the persecuted. It's also the stories of the helpers and the rescuers, those who risk their lives every day, their free lives, to do what they could to save the people who were targeted by the Nazi regime. Speaking of the Holocaust, President Reagan once said, the freedom we enjoy carries with it a tremendous responsibility. Good and decent people must not close their eyes to evil, must not ignore the suffering of the innocent, and must never remain silent and inactive in times of moral crisis. As you listen to Larry speak today about Corrie Ten Boom and her family, I think you will all agree, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Ten Booms, they did not close their eyes to evil. They did not ignore the suffering of the innocent, and they did not remain inactive in times of moral crisis. So let's not waste any time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Larry Loftus. Thank you. So thank you for joining us this evening. I have a handful of questions. Thanks um, for having me. Of course. Um, so what made you choose the Ten Boom story to chronicle? My background is, if any of you have seen some of the other books, is World War II books, history. And I, had, I have a fascination for World War II. I have a fascination for espionage. I was a political science major in college, a lawyer by training and practice for a number of years. And I just, I, I wanted to find a genre that I could spend a career in. World War II was a worldwide event. 
Uh, every country was involved. And so I started with an MI6 spy. He was actually a double agent, Dusko Popov, who had, he was Serbian, but he offered his services to the British before his country is even in the, before Yugoslavia is even in the war. So I decided to, to research about this guy, and the more I found, I'm like, God, this is incredible. So I just fell in love with the, the espionage and the high level, the drama, the tension that is throughout if you're a spy. Um, so the second book that I did was about another intelligence agency and another spy, uh, Odette Sanson and her commanding officer, Peter Churchill, no relation to Winston, but they were SOE, which is the special operations executive that the British had, which is kind of a sabotage spy outfit. And then the third one was about Elaine Griffith, who was an OSS spy operating out of Spain. So for book number four, I wanted a new spy agency and I wanted a new country. Well, I, I had already done all of the spy agencies, MI5, MI6, SOE, so I thought, well, what else can I do? And I remembered back, I had a friend who, when I was researching Codename Lease, had said, Larry, you need to read this book called The Hiding Place. And I, and I knew about the book, and I knew about Corey Ten Boom, but I'd never read it. And so I said, well, why? And she said, because at the same time that Odette Sampson, my character in Codename Lease, at the same time she's incarcerated at Ravensbrook, Corey Ten Boom is there, incarcerated in Ravensbrook. And unlike my character, who was a spy, who had already been condemned to death, they had her in a bunker below ground in a little cell, a little bit bigger than a closet, no lights, no windows, and she was in utter darkness. She had no idea what was going on outside around her. Well, enter Corey. Corey was on the outside. She was in the normal barracks, she and her sister, Betsy. So she got to see the day-to-day -day operations, the, the roll call. They would have to stand out and roll call for five hours in a morning, six hours. And it didn't matter what the temperature was. It could be 10 degrees. They still had to go out there. It could be pouring down. They still had to go out there. And the beatings and just all of the things that happen in the camp, the, the punishment rooms. Corey got to see all that. So the hiding place allowed me to have a better perspective of Ravensbrook as a whole because my character couldn't see the outside, what was going on around her. So um, when I finished that, and if you look in Codename Lease, you'll see citations to The Hiding Place because it's telling you what Corey said about it. So when it was time for the next book, I thought, okay, I want a new country, I want a new spy agency. Uh, the Netherlands is a new spy agency. My mind kept going back to Corey, and she was not a spy, however, the consequences of being involved with the Dutch resistance, which she and her family were, are the same. If you get caught, you're either going to be shot or sent to a concentration camp. So the tension, I, I try to write all of my books as thrillers. They're all nonfiction, and I know that sounds like an oxymoron. A thriller can't be fiction. It's got to be, you know, can't be nonfiction. Um, I, I, I just take exciting stories, and as Hitchcock once said, uh, suspense drama is just life with the boring parts taken out. So that's my job. I take out all the boring parts and leave all the cool, exciting tension. And so I, I knew at that point that this would be a good potential um, book, but I had to answer the question, well, The Hiding Place has already been written. What, what, what else? I mean, is there a story there that I'm going to add? And so I thought it's worth checking out. I'd learned from my first three books, all of which had prior biographies or autobiographies, and in one case both, about the subject that I was writing about, they, they, they didn't have all of the story. And so I was used to seeing that, and I, and I read the, the Hiding Place, and I knew this is, this is maybe not even half the story. So I started doing research. Well, it turns out Corey didn't write The Hiding Place. If you look on the book, it'll say, with John and Elizabeth Sherrill, professional writers. They wrote the book, and, and I didn't know that, but I, it's commonplace nowadays. You'll see with, and that's usually the person that actually wrote it, by interviewing. And uh, all of Corey's archives are at, the, uh, at Wheaton College in the Billy Graham Center there. So I went four days. I'm pouring through all of the records, all of the files, all of her letters, all of her photos, all of her letters from prison, all of her letters from uh, wherever she was in Dutch, which I later had to get translations for English, 
Um, all of her passports are in there. Uh, everything from from the the, the, the Vod Yashem, the, the, when you plant a tree, when Israel brings you in, you plant a tree. There are leaves, and I'm looking through the photos. They had cut off a, a snippet of the leaves that are still there in the in the you know from whenever this was 1960 something. So all of that's in there. So anyway, I poured through all of these archives. Four days I spent there, and. What I found was the hiding place is not even 10% of the story. Um, and so I started doing research. I thought, okay, I'm going to keep doing research. I'm going uh, to read about everyone that was involved around the story. So, for example, the second most important person in this story, the watchmaker's daughter, is a young a Dutch boy named Hans Poli. Well, he's not even in the hiding place, and, and he's so important. He was the first refugee that they brought in, and by the way, the Dutch boys had to hide too, just like Jews, because if you're a Dutch boy and the Gestapo comes through your neighborhood, if they see you, they just snatch you off the street, put you on a train, just like they're doing with Jews going to Auschwitz, they put you on a train to go to work in a German factory, because all of the men that had previously worked in the factory were now in the military. So they just started snatching boys and they would catch 10 at a time, 20 at a time. They would raid houses individually. This happened to the 10 booms on two occasions. They would barge in, kick the door in, come in, and hunt for boys. So Hans Pauli was, so the Dutch boys had to hide. So Hans Pauli was the first person the 10 booms hid. He was in their home longer than anyone else, nine months. He was the first person that was actually involved with the Dutch resistance. In fact, he's the one that got Corey involved because he felt like, I can't just sit up here in good conscience and do nothing. I mean, this is like what Bonhoeffer goes through, if you know that story. I can't just do nothing. So he, through some friends, got in touch with the Dutch resistance and said, I want to help. I, wa I, wa I want to be involved. Now, he's living in their home. He's living in the Ten Boom home. And he said, I want to be involved. And they said, okay, fine. They used him as a courier initially, which means he would have to dress up as a girl. So Corey and Betsy would dress him up as a girl to go out on a courier run, courier run on Corey's bike. You know, the, the hair, the dress, all that stuff. So then he did that a few times, and then they came back and they said uh, they gave him a gun. Well, even owning a gun under Nazi law was a capital offense. So if you get caught, they just kill you. So he takes a big gulp, and, and he takes the gun. Uh, because they had another assignment coming up for him. They said, we want you to shadow a Gestapo agent, a notorious Gestapo, Gestapo agent that we're thinking of taking out. We're thinking of assassinating. Well, connect the dots. They gave Hans the gun, so, and then they told him to shadow him. So now he's thinking, I, I, I'm not an assassin. I'm not even a soldier. But Dutch resistance, you got to do your part. So... Anyway, he has to tell the family. He tells Corey, oh, I got some news. I joined the, the Dutch resistance because it would bring tremendous danger to the family. If he gets caught, they're going to raid the home and they're going to arrest everybody and send them off to concentration camps. So he tells Corey thinking, she may go nuts over this, but I've got to tell her. And what does Corey say? Hans, that's great. We want to be involved. You use our home as your headquarters. And, they, and, and so he said, okay. So from that point on, they were in. So he, he, he makes connections. And next thing you know, Corey's collecting ration cards so they can distribute them out to Jews. And um, Hans continues what he's doing. And, and so the family gets involved and, and uh, they start hiding people. They start hiding Jews. They start hiding other Dutch boys. And the, uh, Hans is the one, actually, who decided we need to find a hiding place in the home because we all can't just hide under the beds. So he looked around and he thought, okay, there's an attic, but that's the first place they'll check. He goes to another place in the home and he cuts a hole in the roof and says, let's go up here. This will be our secret hiding place. Well, it took too long. It took too, you know, the Gestapo is going to come in, watch shop is on the first floor, their residential is on the next two floors. It would take too long to get everybody up hiding in this attic space. So then um, that didn't work. And Corey said, well, let me talk to somebody. So she finds a person involved in the resistance who said, I'll send an architect. They sent an architect. Long story short, they build a beautiful, perfect 
uh, espionage proof hiding place by building a false wall in Corey's room. So anyway, that, so this very significant person, uh, Hans Pauli, is not, even in the, is not even in the hiding place. It's not even in the story. And the reason is because Corey didn't write that book. She wrote an autobiography in 1947 called A Prisoner and Yet. It was a very simple book. It was basically self-published. It didn't get a lot of traction. Um, and if you know the story of Louis Zamperini, kind of similar. Louis Zamperini wrote his own memoir called Devil at My Heels, but he's not a professional writer. Well, later, you know, around, <laughs> Laura Hillenbrand comes around and says, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this right. Let me, let me do this right for you. So she writes Unbroken you know, which spends, what, four years on the New York Times list and movie and all that. So um, that's, that's kind of the, the, the big picture of why I, I picked this book. Hans Pohl is not, not there. Um, and, and by the way, Corey did mention Hans five times in A Prisoner and Yet. Five times she mentions him, which tells me that the Sherrills didn't read that book, you know, her 1947 book. Uh, or at least not very carefully. So anyway, and there were other people that were not really talked about much in there, like her nephew, Peter Van Warden. Peter was Corey's sister, Nolly's son, so Corey's nephew, and he was involved in the resistance as well. And so I had to get his story. Well, it turns out he wrote his own book in 1954 called The Secret Place. None of that information's in there, so I had to read that book because he's there. I mean, the things that are happening to the family, they're happening to him. He's arrested with everybody else. Hans is arrested with everybody else. And by the way, Hans wrote a book in 1983 called Return to the Hiding Place. And I think he did it in part because he was left out of the hiding place and he was such a... If, if you go to the archives in, in uh, Wheaton College and you go through all the photographs, he's in almost all of them. The photographs w where they would take pictures of the refugees and they would have a little party or they would have a play instrument. Someone would play the piano, someone would play the violin. Well, he's in almost all the pictures and the one that is not, I, 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 and I'm looking at the originals, I turn over and it says, this picture was likely taken by Hans Poli. So anyway, <laughs> that's why I'm like, I've got to, I've got to do my own book because The Hiding Place is less than 10% of the story. You, in, in that book, in The Hiding Place, you don't get anything about Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. Well, hello, Anne Frank is only 10 miles away. She's in Amsterdam. And, and Corey did not keep a diary, which is why The Hiding Place doesn't have a lot of detail and some of the dates and stuff are wrong. Corey didn't keep a diary, so she's telling them about her story, what, 30 years after it happened by memory? Well, Hans Pauli kept a diary. So when you go through the, the, the watchmaker's daughter and you see dates, just go to the end notes if you want to see where the dates come from because that's one of the places where I got them um, because he did keep a daily diary throughout the entire war. Um, and, and so that was a tremendous help to me uh, as well as uh, Peter's book. Um, but the, the other thing that I want to say is that not only is Anne Frank, and Anne Frank, as you know, kept a diary too. So that book gave me dates because she would say on this day, you know, the, the, the RAF flew over or the, the Germans bombed us. I saw these, these Jews being snatched off the street, blah, blah, blah. So I've got a day-by-day -day diary from two different people, one in Harlem, which is Hans and, and, and Corey's house, and one with Anne Frank in Amsterdam, just 10 miles away. And oh, by the way, there is another 13-year-old living in Arnhem by the name of Audrey Hepburn. So Audrey Hepburn had her own visions uh, or, or, or instances when she saw things. So there was a biography about her that I had to read that gives qu her quotes about what she saw. She saw Jews being rounded up, thrown into cattle cars, packed in, you know, as tight as could be like sardines. So she's writing about what she is seeing. So I had to bring in all these other people. Then there's Queen Wilhelmina, who's the Dutch queen, and the Dutch loved her. She was, to give it a little perspective, in America we don't really learn about Queen Wilhelmina in the Netherlands during World War II, but she was for the Dutch what Winston Churchill was for the British. She was their anchor. She was their hope. She, and she was, she was very, she was a great speaker, 
um, well, she had to get out in the nick of time when they started bombing Rotterdam and, and she's in The Hague and the commanding officer of the, of the army says, hey, we got to get out now. We got to get you out. So they, they escort her out and they, um, she goes to London on a British destroyer. So Queen Wilhelmina then is giving radio addresses on the BBC to her people in Dutch to give them strength. Well, the Nazis figured that out. They outlawed radios. You couldn't have radio in your house. So there's a, 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 an interesting story in the book about when they collect radios and Corey has to lie when she takes one. They, they had two, and she takes one in, and she knew what was coming. The, the, the guy says, okay, now is this the only radio in your house? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And Corey leaves and she's like devastated. It was the first time in her life she had ever lied. And, and so that drama literally plays out every day for, for five years. I mean, from 1940 until the end of the war. So um, anyway, so I had to bring Quilomina in because she was, Corey loved her. She was a big source of inspiration for the Dutch. So all of these players I had to bring in, you know, from Peter and, and Hans and, and Anne Frank and Audrey Hepburn, Queen Wilhelmina, then what the British were doing, what the Germans were doing. Uh, by the way, the SOE, if you're familiar with them, they were dropping agents into uh, the Netherlands, spies sabotage spies into the Netherlands. And I won't spoil it by telling you what happened, but uh, it's in the book and uh, it, I had the exact dates when all this stuff happened. A lot of people died, a lot of people died. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just leave it, you'll have to read it, but I'll just leave it at that. So I know that's a long answer, sorry to be so long winded. Yep. I'm a lawyer, you have to forgive me. You answered about six <laughs> questions in the stack already, so I'm good. Um, <laughs> right. you, you brushed upon you know, spending four days in the archives and reading Anne Frank's book and reading all these other books, but I mean, the research you did for this book, there's so many footnotes and endnotes. Talk about your process of when you write a book. What, what do you do to kind of create that book research-wise? Yeah, the, the, the research, my, I have a research sort of formula, and I first have a principle, and that is I'm writing nonfiction. This is history, I have to get it right. There's no, you can't go back and redo the book. You get one shot and you've got to get it right. And so um, fortunately, uh, my training, not, not just as a lawyer, but when I was in law school, I was on law review. And on law review, they have you basically write these long, um, basically, uh, your, your take on a court decision. And it might be this court decided this, and this court decided this, and what's the Florida Supreme Court gonna do? I went to the University of Florida, so we're looking at Florida cases. And so uh, I, on the law review, I learned how to do intense research. Because if you're in front of a judge, you can't get it wrong either. And, and if you're submitting a brief to a judge, every case has to be cited every statement of fact, every statement of fact has to be backed up by a case. So from my perspective on the law review is you have to basically footnote or put in an end note where everything came from if it's an affirmative statement. John went to the 7-Eleven on August 19. Well, where'd that come from? Did you make that up? So I have to put in the end notes where I got that. If you see a quote, any quote, Anywhere in any of my books, they're all verbatim from a primary source. I can't make up any. Uh, I had one editor that asked me to, and I said, no, no, this is nonfiction. Uh, I can't make up any dialogue. So you look at any quote that's in the book, whether it's Corey or it's Hans or it's anybody, just go to the back and look in the end notes, and it'll tell you where that came from, all from primary sources. So that training and, and, and the law review and then practicing as a lawyer, it just made me comfortable with intense research. Um, and, and there's a certain pride that you want to take in your work because I want it to be accurate. I want it to be accurate where anybody in the country, because when you write a law review article, people will check it. If you, and I published, a, when, I became, when I was a young lawyer, I published a number of academic uh, journal articles for different universities, and there will be people that will check every single one of your citations, every single one, because it might be a clerk for a judge, because the judge wants to cite to this law review article, and so the clerk will go and search to make sure that you got it right, 
to make sure you didn't embellish the story or you didn't miss the conclusion. And so you know that if if I don't get this right, I'm going to hear about it. So that's the, the process. That's what I bring to the table when I start a book is everything has to be footnoted. Everything has to be cited. So anybody that wants to check, whether it's a quote, whether it's a date, whether it's a person's name, the spelling of the house, the bay that they're in, all of those things, the spelling of restaurants, I, I, I have to take them from primary sources, so that's why I spend a lot of time in the archives. Um, for prior books, the, the um, National Archives, National Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland, for the UK stuff, the uh, UK National Archives at Kew, uh, and the book that I'm working on now, I'm actually dealing with archives from Sweden, uh, which is interesting because half are in Swedish and half are in German neither of which I speak, so I had to get all those translated. But anyway. <laughs> and do you know how her archives ended up at the Billy Graham archives? I think that Corey's archives ended up at the Billy Graham Center because Corey and Billy Graham were very good friends. And if you look in the archives, you'll see a lot of photos with her and Billy Graham because when he would have these stadium, uh, or in some places in, in different countries, I saw a, a photo in the Billy Graham Center where th- there must be half a million people. This, I think it was in India. There must be a half a million people in, in, the, in, the, in the audience. It's outside. Um, he would sometimes have her speak. So he would speak and, and then have her speak because he knew her story. So she visited him on numerous occasions. So in the archives, in her archives, there are photos with um, her and, uh, and Billy Graham, and there's one with her and Billy Graham and Franklin Graham, and there's one with Billy Graham and, and Ruth Graham, his wife. So uh, they were friends, and I think what happened is the people in charge of Corey's foundation knew we have to have a place to park all this, just like having the Reagan Library. Where do we park it? Where do we put all the stuff? Where do we put all the archives, all the photos, everything? And they decided that the best, most logical place was the Billy Graham Center because A, they're good friends. B, this thing is run just like uh, NARA. You know, when you go to, to College Park, Maryland and you go to National Archives, there's security you have to go through. And it's worse than the airport. I mean, you have to go through all kinds of, there's security guards everywhere because these are the archives from history, from American history. Uh, I'm, you know, for any of the lion's mouth, I'm looking at the actual documents that J. Edgar Hoover looked at. I'm, I'm looking at the originals with his signature. And so they have to be very careful. So Corey's foundation needed a place where they could house all of her material, photos, letters, everything, pamphlets, her magazines, everything. And so I think they just said, well, A, he was good, she was good friends with Billy Graham. B, this is a safe place. It is located in the, in the, on the campus of a university, Wheaton College. So it was just a perfect storm, if you will, of we got a safe place, it, it's on a college, and she was good friends with Billy Graham, so I, I think that's why they picked it. Um, so obviously then it was very clear to the Ten Booms that if people were caught hiding Jews, helping Jews, helping in the resistance, they themselves would get sent to concentration camps but the Ten Booms never slowed down their efforts. Did you find anything in your research about why they just kept moving forward? Yeah, there's, in the middle of war, when you're in, when you're in Harlem or you're in Amsterdam, the war is all around you. Uh, they're, they're occupied by the Nazis, so you've got typically Gestapo agents or SS soldiers, and so you're always on edge. There's, there's, there's always tension, and um, so, Corey and her family had to do what Bonhoeffer did, and that is you have to make a decision. You can't just, you know, Bonhoeffer's famous for saying that you can't just watch evil happening and say, oh, that's really bad. Oh, those, those people are mean. They're, they're, they're terrible. They shouldn't be doing that. Oh, I feel sorry for these people. That's, Bonhoeffer would say, that's not enough. And, and, and he would say, you, if, if you're a person of faith, you have to show that by your deeds. In fact, I had an interview this morning with Eric Metaxas, who wrote a great book on Bonhoeffer, and, and he, he had memorized that quote about doing things by deed. And if you look in the front of the watchmaker's daughter, there's the epigram is a Bonhoeffer quote, and it's where Bonhoeffer says that you, you can't just wish good things. You have to take action. If you're a person of faith, you have to take action with deeds. 
And so Bonhoeffer did and gave his life for the cause and the Ten Booms did. And they, she was in a very uh, devout Christian family all the way back to her great grandfather. Uh, they, they loved the Jews. They prayed for Jerusalem. That continues to her grandfather. That continues to her father Casper. And then it continues to her. So it was nothing for them to be uh, praying for the Jews or thinking about them or inviting Jews into their home because that, that was their heritage in their family for, a very, for generations. It's just that when World War II breaks out, okay, now we've got to really test our faith and, and, and start hiding them. Mm -hmm. And they knew, they knew the consequences. If you hide Jews or Dutch boys, either one, if you get caught hiding who the Germans are looking for, you're going to go to jail, number one. You'll be arrested, you're going to go to jail. And then you will probably go to prison. They, they had uh, a number of prisons around there. There was one in Amsterdam. And then from prison, you'll be interviewed. And if they think you're really bad, like, like you really did hide a bunch of Jews or you really did pass ration cards to Jews or you really did uh, get involved in the Dutch resistance, then you're going to a concentration camp. And if it's really bad, well, they're just going to execute you. And so there's a, there's a case in the book where Corey is before the German who makes that decision. It's a whole interesting part of the, the, the story of Lieutenant Hans Rams, who was a German. The SS ran all the prisons. The SS is, is part of the Nazi party. The Wehrmacht were not part of the, the, the Nazi uh, party. And the Wehrmacht people, the mil professional military people, actually hated the Nazis because there were these upstarts that were basically thugs day, you know, on, on Monday and Tuesday they, they have a uniform that makes them look like a soldier. So they didn't, there, you had all this tension and animosity between them. But um, th that, that kind of daily tension and, 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 and drama literally was, was nonstop every day. And so Corey knew going in, if we do this, if we start taking them in, there's a good chance that we'll be caught. And if we're caught, we're going to suffer the consequences. And like Bonhoeffer, Corey said, so be it. I mean, she talked to her father, Casper, who was 80, by the way, when World War II starts. So Cor he's the head of the home, and they, they, they love him. He's the patriarch. But Corey is kind of running the house, and she's running the, sh the watch shop because her father's 80. So she and Betsy, she's 50. Betsy's like 54. So anyway, they knew that they could be in serious trouble, and they were willing to risk it because we have to help our neighbors. And it doesn't matter if they're Jews or, or non-Jews, if they're Dutch, or it doesn't matter. We have to help our neighbors. And so they did. There is a chapter or section in your book where um, Nazi German soldiers knock on the door and um, tell her that they want out, that they want to help her. And she has to believe and trust that they're telling the truth, and they are, um, and that they really do want to help her with the resistance. Um, so I guess one of my questions is, how do you trust that? And then two, in your research, did you come across, I mean, how common was it to have Nazi guards wanting to actually flip sides and help the Jews? Well, that's the distinction you have to draw because as Americans, we just kind of assume that Nazi and German are the same. They're not. The, 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 the Nazi party only got 40% of the vote and they didn't even know who Hitler was. So they, they didn't even get a majority. And then as people started finding out who he was, all of the Wehrmacht, the German military, all of the leaders I, I cover, I've covered it in basically three books now, but you can read the details of it in The Watchmaker's Daughter. The Wehrmacht hated Hitler and they tried to assassinate him multiple times, multiple times. The last one you may, if you saw Tom Cruise and Valkyrie, then you know, okay, that was one of them. Well, there were many before that. And the German generals, there was one called the, the General's Plot, where all of the German Wehrmacht generals were going to basically assassinate Hitler. The only difference was some wanted to arrest him, like Rommel wanted to arrest him and put him on trial so that he didn't become a martyr for the Nazi fanatics over here. And then other German generals and field marshals said, no, we need to execute him. And so that was the only difference. They all wanted to get rid of Hitler. Um, in fact, if you know the, the story with Rommel, that's why he was basically 
executed. He, he was given poison because they, they found out he was involved in the, in the, in the, the plot, the July 20, 1944 plot to, get, to kill Hitler. And so they made, they made him take poison or they said, we'll take it out on your family. So he did. So the reason that, that, that and, and I know this because I know the animosity between the Wehrmacht, the normal soldiers, and the sort of the fake thug soldiers, which are known as the SS, the Gestapo's part of the SS, and you know at the very top of that's Heinrich Himmler, this fanatical Nazi. And so when, the, when, when I found out that these, these uh, three soldiers show up at her door, uh, they're, not, they're not Nazis. If they were Nazis, they, they'd be all over it. I mean, if they, they would love their job. If they were Nazis, they hate Jews, and they want to capture as many as they can. Well, they're not. These are normal Wehrmacht soldiers, and they, they, they hate the, the Nazis more than anybody else because they know who they are. So these were Wehrmacht soldiers that, that hated their job. Even Lieutenant Hans Rams, who works for, the, he, he's an employee of the SS, which is part of the Nazi party, but he's not a Nazi, really. I mean, he, that's his job. And so these people had a dilemma. Do you do evil in the name of Adolf Hitler or do you fight it and suffer the consequences? And if you fight it and suffer the consequences, you may be the person that's on the end of the news. And so all of them had to deal with this and, and their conscience was, was what, you know, was the dividing factor. So for people like these three soldiers, they said, we can't, we can't do this anymore. Hans Romps essentially says this. She, she has, Corey has a long conversation. Corey, Betsy, and Peter Van Warden all have long conversations with Hans Roms because he's the one that is investigating them and is sort of their judge to find out what's going to happen. And so Corey has a, a quiet moment with him and she says, are you in a dark place? And he just kind of pauses and he looks down and he says, you have no idea. My family... And he's like, he's starting to break down. And he says, my family, I don't know if my wife is alive. I don't know if my kids are alive. I don't know if they've been bombed. And so he just, like, he breaks down. And so that's what was happening with a lot of Germans, a lot of people in the, in the military, like German soldiers. So anyway, I won't spoil what happens with Hans Roms, mm -hmm. but it's, you'll like him at the end of the book. Uh, but with these soldiers, they couldn't take it anymore. So they said to Corey, we, we heard about you. We heard about something how your house is helping people. We don't want to work for Adolf Hitler. We, we, we want out. We, we want to. So she makes a trade with him. I'll help you. And um, you're going to need civilian clothes to blend in, to hide. And um, so I will need your uniforms. So she takes the, the three German uniforms. Do you want to tell him what she does with the uh, uniform? Yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> well, I don't want to spoil it, but... Um, there, there's, a, <laughs> there's a reason she asked for the uniforms. Um, in Amsterdam, there is, a, there is an old theater, famous theater, that the, the Nazis had turned into basically a holding cell for Jews. They, there were actually two. There was the creche, and then there was the, 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 the building across the street, and they used one for the adults and one for children and babies. And they would basically round up Jews, send them to Amsterdam, put them in these two centers, if you will, for processing. And then from there, they would be put on a cattle car and shipped to Auschwitz or wherever. So it was a processing center. And Corey had heard that they were about to execute 100 babies because it's a nursery. And so she starts trying to get some information. Well, lo and behold, there is a Jew that runs that, that, runs that nursery. The, 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 these, these two buildings are affiliated. And the person who handled the books and the person who ran it, they were both Jews. And so they kind of figured out what was going on. And so they created their own escape line of how to sneak people out. The problem was there were German SS guards, you know, out front. And so maybe I should stop there, but Corey's unif those uniforms were needed for something. <laughs> and and um, they, those, those hundred babies, they saved them. Yeah. 
the Dutch boys that were in the home. Uh, the Dutch boys heard about it. Corey's like, I can't believe this. They're going to kill. And the Dutch boys said, we'll save them. You know, these are 18, 17, 16, 19 year old kids. And they said, we'll save them. We'll save them. And Corey's like, well, how? We'll rescue them. You know, when you're 18, you can, you can do anything. You can walk through walls. So she's like, well, how? There's guards out there. And they're like, well, well, we'll save. Well, next thing you know, these knock, 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 these three German soldiers show up and Corey says, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I have some uniforms now. So anyway, I'll stop there so I won't spoil all of it. Uh, so earlier when you were talking and you were talking about how the Germans or the Nazis were collecting radios and it was the first lie Corey had made. Yeah. Um, that was something that struck me in the book that they are breaking, the, the Ten Boom family is breaking all sorts of rules and laws thankfully, saving hundreds of lives. Um, but there's a section where you talk about her sister, Nolly. Mm -hmm. And Nolly says, I'll do all these things. I'll steal ration cards. I'll hide Jews. I'll do whatever you need me to do, but I will not lie. And if someone asks me if I am hiding Jews, I will tell them, yes, I am. Um, do you know why? Yeah, and, and it's assuming this is true, what she said, that Nolly had said, uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie because we're not supposed to lie as Christians. So... She uh, had told Corey that anyway, one of the one of the boys, one of the refugees heard about it and um, in, 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 in their home with the, the, the they're called Dutch divers. Those are the Dutch boys that are hiding. They also have Jews. And one of the Jews was a very what should we call him vivacious? <laughs> you see, <laughs> there is a Jew, a uh, young Jew in, in the home hiding named Yusi. That's not his real name. His real name was Meyer Mossel, but he, they, they gave him the nickname UC. Hans did. Hans actually gave him that nickname uh, because it was Hans' birthday. And UC said, well, why don't you give me a name? So he said, okay, you'll be UC. So anyway, UC heard this when, when two of these two, uh, uh, I think Betsy, no, not Betsy. One of the two of the people that were in the home had heard about what Nolly had said that she would, if she, you know, if they come to her, her house, she's going to tell them, yeah, you know, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I've got Jews in here. And Yusi heard it and just became livid. I mean, there was smoke coming out of his ears. He was so mad. And so he rushes up there and he says, did I hear right? Did I hear right? The, it was Leendert, who was one of the Dutch divers, who was explaining it to a Dutch, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a Jewish girl who was there at the time. And Yusi hears it and it just explodes. And he says, you're telling me that she would, you know, in, in, instead of lying, she's, she's going to have, you know, all these Jews killed? Because if the Germans barge in and, they, and she says, yeah, I've got Jews in here, well, they're going to come snatch them. So he was really mad. So Corey's there and hears it. And Corey comes in at Yusi, it's okay, sit down. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Take a deep breath. And he said, the reason that Nolly said that is because she doesn't want to give false testimony. She's a Christian. And we as Christians believe, she believes that if she tells the truth, that God will honor that and will save them in another way. And you see, just, he just, you know, he was about to, to, to pass out. He was so mad. You see, said, don't you realize who Rahab was? Rahab lied to save the Israelite spies. Don't you know about Moses' midwives? They lied to, you know, to save these, these babies. And he says, come on, it's in the Old Testament that it's okay sometimes to lie. And so Corey's like, well, that's a good point, <laughs> you know. So uh, I don't know if they ever went back to Nolly to get her to change her mind, but it, that point does come up a couple of times. Um, but when, in the end of the book, when they do come to raid the home, Corey, Betsy, everybody says, Jews, what are you talking about? We don't have any Jews in here. Well, there were severe consequences for that. So I have a ton more questions, but I want to make sure that the audience has some time to ask a couple. So I'm just going to ask one or two more. Um, one of my favorite things in the book, and you actually mentioned this earlier, um, were all the photos. And I guess they caught me by surprise because aren't the photos proof that they were being hidden or were all the photos taken post liberation of the camps? I, I think they were, t they looked like they were taken while they were in, in hiding. 
They, the, fo- the, the, the key photos, I mean, there's, in, in the archives, there's photos of everything. You know, Corey, when she was a child, when she was a baby, their whole life growing up. But the key ones that I'm looking for are the photos during the war, when, when people were hiding there. So I don't know whose camera it was. I don't know who the photographer was. I think they probably passed the camera around. Uh, and I don't know where they hit them, because the Gestapo raided their home. And they snatched up anything that, you know, would have been, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it was undeveloped film that, that, that survived, that they kept someplace, uh, but it could have been any of them. It could have been Hans that saved them. It could have been Peter, could have been Corey, could have been Betsy, could have been anybody. But somebody saved them. And in Hans's book, there are some photos that uh, are not even in the archives. So those came from him. He, it was, there's so many touching moments in the story. Hans had just gotten engaged, and his fiance's name is Mice. Well, she can't visit him because he's, he's, a Dutch, he's in hiding. And so they're, they, they're in love, and they want to get married, but they can't. And so he, they would write letters, and they think, okay, well, we can't write letters every day. The censors will pick it up. The, the, the Nazis will pick it up. So they just say, well, we'll write once a month. So he'd see her once a month. And then um, he would tell Corey and tell Corey's father. Well, they began to love Mize, even though they, they haven't even met her. So finally she comes. There's a photo of this in, in, uh, in the book, in, which I got from the archives. Mize comes to visit for Christmas. She comes into their home uh, for Christmas. And so they have a big Christmas party. And the family just loved her. And Casper, who's 80 now, says, well, Mize, darling, if, you're, if you love Hans, we love Hans, so we love you too. You're part of the family too. So the Ten Booms, especially Casper, but the Ten Booms just loved people like they were family. Mm-hmm. So the, the Jews, the Dutch divers, everybody that's in their home, they treat them and love them like they are family. Mm-hmm. So my last question um, the faith of this family, right, is really at the center of the book. Um, and while at the concentration camp, um, Betsy tells Corey that she has a vision, that she wants to turn um, a post-war concentration camp into a place for Germans to find a new life and destroy Germany. Corey makes that happen. Can you briefly talk about that? Sure. When they're in Ravensbrück, uh, everybody's dying. Everybody is dying. And there's thousands and thousands of women there. Hard labor, starvation rations, disease, everything. And uh, Betsy's dying. And Betsy says to Corey one night, they had to sleep on, like, if you take like, like maybe two, a panel and a half here on our stage, they had to put five to seven women to sleep in that area with two blankets between five to seven women. And so one night, they're, they're this close, you know, when they're sleeping, they're this close to each other. So Betsy says, Corey, the Germans are the most hurt people of all. She goes, I, I heard that there's like nine million that are homeless. Some have lost fathers, some have lost brothers, some have lost sons. They're the most damaged people of all, emotionally damaged, spiritually damaged. She goes, we have to help them. And Corey's thinking, the heck with that. I'm not going to help these people, you know. But Betsy really was passionate about it. And so Betsy was kind of, their father was, was their spiritual anchor, if you, you will. And then when their father passes away, then Betsy becomes her spiritual anchor. And Betsy says, no, we have to help them. And so Corey takes it on her heart after the war to think about who's been hurt well, you have all of the Dutch people that have been hurt, people that went to concentration camps, people who had sons executed, people that had husbands executed. You have all of the, the Germans on the other side, many of whom hated what they did. They were just doing their job. Uh, the soldiers were just doing their job. Because if you're 25 and you're, and you're a German man, you can't say, oh, yeah, I'm a pacifist. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to join the military. Well, you'd just be executed. So they all had to join. Um, so anyway, they had to decide what we're going to do. Um, and and um, it's, it's just an incredible ongoing drama that, that seems to never end. And so that's... You know, that's what happens as they go through literally every day and, and Corey just decides, 
I'm going to spend, after the war, I'm going to spend the rest, at least the, the, the next few years anyway, doing what Betsy had suggested. And so Corey doesn't start with the Germans. She starts locally. There was a woman in their home, uh, in their hometown in Harlem, who was very wealthy. And she had come up to Corey, who was speaking at a church, and said, I, I love your story. I want to help. And my name is, and she gives her her name, and she says, I live on. And Corey says, oh, I, I know where you live. This woman was very wealthy. And her husband had passed away years before. She had five sons in the war. All but four were killed. Uh, the fifth one, she didn't know where that son was. So she says, I want you to use my home to do that kind of thing you were talking about when you were speaking, to open it up, to help people heal people that have been brokenhearted, people that have been spiritually broken, people that have been physically broken, people that had been tortured, Dutch people. And so, she, oh, she, so the woman says, I'm going to give you my home and I'll move out. And she does. So you have this, I don't know how many rooms, 30 rooms or something, this mansion. And so Corey moves in and turns it into essentially a convalescent home. And then um, Corey realizes, well, there's another group that's really hurting, the Quislings, the people that sided with the, with the Nazis, the Dutch people that turned in their own people, the worst of all. Everybody hated them. They couldn't get jobs. They, they, they were turned away every place. And Corey said, we have to help them too. She moved them into this home for a little while, but the people there who had been hurt by them said, get them out, get them out. You know, they were going to fight with them. And so Corey moved all of the Quislings into her own home, the Baye because she's now in this place. So she moves them all in there and lets them live there in her home. And then there's one more. There's a third in Darmstead. This goes directly to what Betsy has suggested. Corey is talking to a, um, a very large group of people who were in a, a blown out factory. There were about 100 families in this German factory that had no home. Their home was destroyed. And so they have all these people. You have crying babies. You have all this stuff, people that are injured. And, and there's, there's no walls. I mean, so it's all noise all the time. And, and it's just devastated. So Corey's there, and she's sharing her story. And she realizes, I'm going back to luxury. These people are suffering every day. And when I leave, they're going to suffer. I have to help them. And the only way I can help them is if I move in with them. So she moves into this blown out German factory to minister to these Germans, asking nothing in return. And then after she'd been there for a while, somebody comes to visit and says, hey, I, I'm from such and such, and I heard about what you wanted to do. I heard it from somebody. Look, we have a concentration camp, Darmstead, which is closed now. It's an old concentration camp that we can give you, we can offer you to use as a convalescent home for Germans. And she said, really? Let me go take a look. So she goes there and she does. She does exactly what Betsy had said. In fact, in the book, there are before and after pictures that I got from the archives. What Darmstead looked like as a concentration camp with all the barbed wire and everything. And then what it looked like when Corey was done with it. She, you know, of course, they got rid of the barbed wire, but she put flowers everywhere and on all the, the window seals. She put flower boxes and it was beautiful. And it had it could take like 165 people. And within a couple of months, there's a waiting list. And so then you had other organizations, charitable organizations like Catholic group that would come and say, we'll help. We'll help run it. We'll help administrate it. And so anyway, it became very successful, Darmstead. So she actually opened three of these centers to help people. And, and got nothing in return, asked nothing in return. Incredible. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, uh, Trisha, you can go back there. Thank you. Um, I, I was wondering if in your research in Amsterdam, and I was there last year, did you come across information about Hanny Shaft, the red hair? resistance fighter and did she have anything to do with the people you're talking about? I, I did have, uh, I've seen, in fact, because I thought about Hanny Sheff because I thought she's my next book. And so I wanted to, I wanted another, so I, I read about her uh, and it, it, it didn't, she wasn't involved with the 10 booms or anything, but it didn't, uh, it didn't give me enough material. If, if I'm going to take a nonfiction story and turn it into a thriller, I can't just have one fun thing, one cool thing, one murder. I need 
dozens of them because it's a thriller. And while I can't make anything up, I get to decide where chapters end. So when a dead body shows up, end of chapter. Gun shows up, end of chapter. And, and so that allows me to write it as a thriller and people keep turning the pages because they want to know what happened, what happened, what happened. Did she die, did she die? And so um, with Hanny Chef, there, I just didn't think there was enough material where I could do that. And I've, I've turned down a lot of World War II people that did one or two incredible things, but I need like 20 of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm familiar with her, but did not, uh, did not go deeper than that. For our last question, we're going to go right here to the front row. Hi, Jennifer Grossman, Atlas Society. Um, wondering who are your literary influences, favorite authors, either fiction or nonfiction? Oh, great. Who are my literary favorites? The, I'll give you two different, because boy, I could give you a lot, but there's a couple of different genres. On the, on the pure fiction thriller side, I would say Vince Flynn was one of, he, he's, when I read his first thriller, I was excited and I said, man, I, I, wanna, I wanna do that. This was a lot of fun. Um, but in terms of deep intellectual thought and, 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 and that kind of thing, um, my f probably my two favorites would be um, Dostoevsky and the famous Russian who suffered a bit himself, went to prison, but Dostoevsky, The Brothers Karamazov, is a very famous book, um, as are a number of his others, Crimes and Passion. But uh, also Dietrich Bonhoeffer, because of what he went through, and I've mentioned him a couple of times, and I mentioned that the epigram is a quote from him. He, uh, he wrote a number of books, Cost of Discipleship and, and, and some others, but the best book for me, from my perspective was Letters and Papers from Prison, because he was in prison on basically death row, if you will, because he was part of the conspiracy to get rid of Hitler. And the whole time that he's in prison, he's, he's writing. Well, you normally can't get anything out. You normally can't even get writing material. He was a pastor and a theologian. So the German guards just loved him. They loved him. The German guards would come up to him for marital advice. Mm -hmm. Dietrich, Pastor Dietrich, my, my wife, we're having this problem, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, okay, sit down. And so he would counsel them. And people are getting married. And so he would give them marriage counseling. So he wanted to write letters. To, he, was, he was engaged as well. And his fiance and he would exchange letters because the guards loved Bonhoeffer so much that they snuck the letters out. So they would sneak his letters out and the people writing to him, they would sneak in. So he had correspondence with his father, correspondence with his fiance and other people. Um, and so they collected all of those into a book called Letters and Papers from Prison. And it was all of that correspondence going back and forth. And, and he's in prison about to be executed the same time that Corey is. And I love when there's things, different players where things going on in multiple places at the same time. Bonhoeffer in Germany, Anne Frank in Amsterdam, Audrey Hepburn in Arnhem. Corey's family in, in, in Harlem. So there's stuff going on all the time. Queen Wilhelmina in London. So anyway, hope that answers it. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for coming. I'm going to encourage all of you, if you haven't already, to go purchase the book. Um, he's, he's said it a couple times it does read like a thriller. Um, page turner, there's always something to learn. So um, we're going to, again, encourage you to uh, get a book and meet us upstairs. And I want to thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks Great for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you.